Thank you. Um, and I'm also going to be making references to the papers that have come before me because I think there are some really interesting confluences. So as, as we all know, in 1972, Bruce Lee fought Chuck Norris in Rome's Colosseum. The stands were empty of the bloodthirsty crowds of antiquity, though by all accounts, the cinema crowds were plentiful. The amphitheater itself um, is not pictured in the digitally augmented wholeness of Ridley Scott's blockbuster Gladiator, but as the noble wreck and ruinous perfection of Byron's romantic poetry. Once more, reads a publicity card for the film, the Colosseum echoes with the sound of fight to the death. Um, this sequence is compellingly gladiatorial. Obviously in its location, in its celebrity combatants with their distinct systems of fighting, and its celebration of a very Roman notion of virtue or virtue as an ideal of male bravery and physicality. I argue that the gladiatorial evocations of this fight sequence are not exceptional within Lee's oeuvre, nor in the paratextual legacies of his celebrity. From the dojo fights of Fist of Fury, through the tournament structure of Enter the Dragon, even to the statistically led reanimation through the UFC video game uh, that we heard about earlier. In his Western reception, Bruce Lee can be usefully considered as a gladiator, belonging to an established pattern of visual imagery linking the suffering body of the celebrity fighter with virtue, nostalgia, and an iconic embodiment of philosophical principles. This presentation draws from a larger project that I'm working on, Mapping Gladiatorial Imagery in Anglo-American Culture. In it, I analyze the gladiator as an archetype, as a recurring scenario, and even as a resonant cultural impulse. Drawing from this project and a database of almost 500 feature films, television programs, and video games, I'm defining the gladiator as an archetypal character not limited to his Roman origins. He, and it is almost exclusively all male, characters. Um, he's notable for his striking physicality, for his martial skill, and for being simultaneously celebrated and marginalized. As in antiquity, he was branded with the legal status of infamia, or infamy. The gladiator from his origins in Roman funeral games has always had a ritual or spiritual significance. And his violence has always been more than spectacle, it's always been more than art, and it's always been more than skill. The gladiators featured in my study include those who fought in the amphitheaters of the ancient worlds, Maximus in Gladiator, Pam Greer here in the 1974 exploitation film Arena, Milo played by Kit Harrington in Pompeii, and the many Spartacai. So less predictably, it's got to be the plural of Spartacus surely, uh, less predictably perhaps I'm also including Katniss Everdeen from The Hunger Games, the mind-controlled video game avatar John Tillman in Gamer, played by Gerard Butler down there, Tyler Durden in Fight Club, and of course, the performer, fighter, and celebrity, Bruce Lee. So Bruce Lee fits all the features of the gladiator that I've, as I've outlined them, physically striking, iconic even, skilled in martial arts, in which he, like the gladiator, acts simultaneously as a fighter and as a performer embodying a fantasy of masculine virtue, and like the gladiators in Famia, biographers and historians have pointed out to the ways in which Lee was marginalized via institutionalized racism, even emerging as a countercultural celebrity. So the gladiatorial scenario itself that I'm identifying here is deceptively simple. Two men enter, one man leaves. To solidify this definition, the on-screen gladiator is a man, occasionally a woman, forced to fight by circumstances, either through honor or, or to save his family, or through literal enslavement, for the entertainment of a capricious crowd. From the Colosseum, to the Thunderdome, to the most recent installment of the Thor franchise, the gladiatorial scenario plays out in resonant but strikingly conventional ways. While the gladiator is most associated with the sword and sandal film, the, the kind of Italian post-war ones in particular, um, he or she is not limited to this genre. Perhaps you would have seen Bromans, geezers in the time of Caesars. No? That was just me. Yep. Google that. You're welcome. Right. Um, and even 
Genre itself might not be the best word to describe the way the gladiator circulates in visual culture. So I'm suggesting the Italian critical term filone as more appropriate because it implies threads of continuity and intersecting currents of influence. And here I've just sort of flagged up a few of the more um, visible genres or subgenres that the gladiator seems to appear in. According to folklorist Michael Coven, using the term filone in its original context of Italian post-war genre filmmaking, it's best understood as a kind of river with branches flowing in and then out of the central stream. By including Bruce Lee's films and his subsequent celebrity in this gladiatore filone, I aim to make a connection with Italian genre filmmaking, not only in their Western reception. So we've got Lee's films finding Western popularity in the immediate aftermath of the craze for the Italian sword and sandal films. And I think Sergio Leone was mentioned earlier, and certainly he's a figure here. He did direct a sword and sandal film, but he's more known for his Westerns. So I also want to connect Bruce Lee's films with Italian genre cinema as examples of exceptionally successful, low-budget, hybrid, hybrid transnational genre cinema. It's a lot of words there. Okay. Um, it's founded essentially on celebrations of redemptive violence and martial masculinity. So in a, in a powerful maelstrom of these kinds of currents, I position Bruce Lee. Where is he? There he is. He's the center around which a complex feedback loop crystallizes between redemptive violence, philosophy, nostalgia, and transnational uh, genre cinema. If we take gladiatorial masculinity as a barometer for measuring shifts in cultural mythology, and I do, then the wildfire of Lee's celebrity and its ongoing digitally augmented legacies represent a, measure a measurable shift in Western fantasies of ideal manhood. Lee's appearance in Enter the Dragon is a stepping stone, a key stepping stone, for bringing the gladiatorial archetype out of the Colosseum and into the present day. Or perhaps to return to my opening um, section, to step back into the Colosseum as a ruin, as a crumbling monument to past articulations of the warrior. And here are some of the, the representative films that I've used. And these ones are set in the past, these in the, the kind of post-apocalyptic future or futures. And I position Enter the Dragon as one of the first instances where you see this gladiatorial scenario set in the present. So Enter the Dragon marks the moment when the gladiator learns something of a, of a pan-Asian martial art, the ghost of which you can see in the stylized violence of Pompeii or the Stars series Spartacus Blood and Sand. This is also the moment when the gladiator's body moved away from the bulk of the bodybuilders like Steve Reeves or Kirk Morris and to the more kinetic definition of bodies like Lee's and subsequently Brad Pitt, Kit Harington and Jason Statham, all of which would go on to play gladiator characters. Lee's celebrity hinges on his abilities as a martial artist, uh, bringing a kind of edge of authenticity to the gladiator battles that before that had been sort of implied through the impressive physical size or lifting strength of the bodybuilder characters. So you could have Steve Reeves lifting up a tree and that would be your authenticity. Look how big he is. Um, Lee's on-screen physicality was kinetic rather than sculptural, although the nature of the fights in Lee's films left moments of sculptural intensity, recalling the kind of classical, the classicism of ancient world statuary. Um, and I'd like to point to the presentation we had immediately before lunch and that brilliant um, sort of action versus stasis, which is, is clearly a part of this sort of moments of kinetic intensity and then sort of sculptural resonance. In current gladiator fictions like Spartacus, um, the aesthetics of high speed digital cameras permits that kind of rapid movement and slow motion posing to happen in the exact same moment, even in the same shot. And I think we're all familiar with 300 and the way they use that sort of extreme slow motion to permit posing and action at the exact same time. So freezing in the exact moment of violence while also lingering on the built body of the warrior. Um, Enter the Dragon, as we know, was released on Western screens shortly after Bruce Lee's death in July of 73. 
Leon Hunt, Paul Bowman, and others insist that Lee's Western stardom is built on the paradox of an impossibly, and here I'm quoting Leon Hunt, uh, the paradox of an impossibly athletic, charismatic star who seemed to have burned out on first contact. In this context, Lee's death was always part of his aura. I would insist that this is a fundamental feature of the gladiator. They are the moratori, of those about to die. This infamous gladiator salute, we who are about to die salute you, underpins the mythological appeal and the melodramatic impact of the gladiator. They are always about to die, even at the height of their martial skill, physical fitness, or youthful beauty. In his comprehensive study of the sword and sandal film, Richard Rushing argues that this about to die of the gladiator is a key factor to the way the genre imagines static time. So that's perfectly illustrated by the slow motion of the digital cap, uh, camera that I've captured in, in GIF form here. Um, <clears throat> it also frames the nostalgic register of the gladiator as a man who's always out of time, and I mean that in both senses of the word. You know, he's outside of the time he should be, and he is out of time. This about to die aura sort of fuels the afterburn of Lee's celebrity. And it cements the elegiac structure of feeling that, is, that now sort of really belongs to the gladiator archetype. If Maximus and Gladiator was anything, he was sad. Very sad. Um, while the gladiator has always been a man out of step with time, in Lee's celebrity discourse, there's a mournful sincerity that was absent in previous cinematic images of gladiators. I should also say that this mournful sincerity is sometimes not always a part of his cinematic roles, if you think of Way of the Dragon. So I'd like to zero in on another significant way in which Bruce Lee affected a change to this gladiator archetype, connecting the gladiators of the past with those of the present and the post-apocalyptic future. Um, that is his engagement and association with philosophy. We've heard a lot about this. So, in a now very widely circulated interview, Canadian author and historian Pierre Burton connects Lee's superstar martial artist persona with philosophy. And significantly, in this interview, he connects it with the Greco-Roman world. So Burton says, we don't in our world, by which he means the West, and haven't since the days of the Greeks who did combine philosophy and art with sport. But quite clearly, the Oriental attitude is that they are three facets of the same thing. Here, Burton connects the Western classical past with a, a generic Orientalist East Asian present, suggesting that Lee's articulation of violence belongs in some way to Western classicist ideals. Gladiators, well known as fighting performers like Lee, have likewise an established relationship to philosophy and to philosophers. Yep, some Seneca over there. So the philosophical schools of ancient Rome showed significant interest in the figure of the gladiator. In particular, Stoic thinkers like Cicero, Seneca, and Galen, who was a physician to the gladiators as well. So just permit me one fanciful turn that I just can't help connecting Cato with the Stoic philosopher Cato. So here we have Cato the Younger and also Cato. They're both called Cato. Hmm. Yeah. I have nothing to say about that except look at that. <laughs> Interesting. So Stoic writers have provided key literary evidence on gladiators. Furthermore, they, like the Christian writers that were to follow them, for example, St. Augustine, um, they used gladiators as resonant examples for their teaching on ethics and morality, and then cautionary tales in the case of St. Augustine, but examples of, and virtuous ideals in the case of the Stoics. So that is an element from St. Augustine's confessions. So unlike the later Christian thinkers like Augustine, the Stoics often use the gladiator as illustrative of an example of, of kind of ideal masculine virtue, acting in harmony with the nature of the universe and as a symbol to emulate. Seneca likens the gladiator to a Stoic wise man, um, and Cicero points to the gladiator's discipline and ability to withstand pain. Um, it's it, but it, it's sort of particularly as a, as a pedagogical tool that the gladiator is of the most concern to Roman philosophy. And I think that's something that absolutely carries over into Bruce Lee's celebrity persona. This was also, interestingly, a feature of the strongman characters of the sword and sandal film. If they were anything else, they were there to teach 
the boys around them in the films, and perhaps even the boys in the audience who might be watching them, sort of psychoanalytic versions of successful adult manhood. Um, where the gladiators of Rome and their cinematic realizations were generally used as illustrative examples for philosophy. It was Bruce Lee who changed the gladiatorial archetype in the wake of this post-war sword and sandal film, adding a philosophical intellectualism that had not been a part of this masculinity before. So you get the silent brooding character of someone like Ursus in Quo Vadis, or even the sort of grinning, joyful heroics of Steve Reeves in the other sword and sandal films. So the gladiator went from being the body on which the philosopher might meditate to the body that fights and philosophizes, that philosophizes through fighting, fights through philosophy. So the philosophical gladiators, kind of emerging in the wake of Bruce Lee's popularity, exhibit a kind of popular or sort of vernacular stoicism, drawing from neoclassicist discourse of Roman stoicism, and like Pierre Burton, grafting it on to transnational iterations of Asian warrior masculinity. So they're kind of using it in a very interesting, casual way. So what emerges is a hybrid vernacular stoicism, which can nostalgically recall the traditions of the past while seeming at the same time urgently relevant and modern. Nancy Sherman defines the vernacular sense of stoicism as a fundamental part of military identity. She argues that it has now become associated with control, with discipline, with endurance. Um, and I think it's via social media, to take a jump from the Stoics to Twitter, that we can see a particular bias towards reading Bruce Lee as a Stoic warrior ideal. So here I've, I've borrowed from the toolkit of the digital humanities and just sort of dipped my toe in the pool of those kinds of expertise. And I've used the hashtag Bruce Lee as a fruitful kind of cross-section for analyzing Bruce Lee's digital legacy and illustrating how he's now associated with a philosophically inclined stoic martial ma masculinity. So I kept this quite recent to see what's going on right now. And I can say that in the past sort of month, from the 24th of June to the 4th of July, there were at least 1,731 posts on Twitter using the Bruce Lee hashtag. So many of these were aphorisms. So you'll have a picture of Bruce Lee with one of his sayings, be like water, um, written over top of it. Um, and they're also co-coded with sort of other hashtags like inspiration, hero, fitness, or fitspiration. Um, I had to be a little bit careful because I, I ran this through the software yesterday, but of course, we're tweeting about Bruce Lee, so it, it made a little bit of a difference to what was going on. So, um, using sentiment visualization software, uh, we can see that Bruce Lee inspires tweets on an emotional register that is largely pleasant. There are very few people on Twitter saying mean things about Bruce Lee. Probably does not surprise us. Um, they fall under the label of calm, serene, um, contented over here but also still figure on this active register as well. So this nicely fits with popular notions of kind of stoic as simultaneously emotionally controlled but active. Thus, the emotional content of Lee's persona has in its digital after afterlife moved away from the kind of comic irreverence of Way of the Dragon or the undigested rage of Fists of Fury to exhibit an active serenity embodied by Lee's characters in Enter the Dragon, or even his appearances on, on Long Street or the Pierre Burton interview. So to conclude, I just want to journey back to the Colosseum. I like it there. Um, where I want to reinforce my argument that Bruce Lee should be considered in the context of these wider patterns of gladiatorial masculinity. His star image conti continues to kind of feed into and out of this gladiatorial felone or network that I've identified. Thank you very much.